broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this evening's Let's Grow webinar titled Preventing and Controlling Foot Rot in Sheep. My name is Jay Parsons, and I will be your host this evening. And in just a moment, I'll introduce this evening's speaker, Dr. Michael Neary of Purdue University. Oh. I'd like to start by uh, thanking the Let's Grow Committee of the American Sheep Industry Association for providing funding for this webinar. Without their support, these webinars would not be possible. And I encourage our listeners to visit their website to learn more about the American sheep industry and to access a large volume of resources available there to help you be successful in the sheep business. The URL for the ASI website is www.sheepusa.org. I'd like to remind our listeners that this webinar is being recorded. All webinar registrants will receive a follow-up email within the next 48 hours with a direct link to the webinar recording, as well as a link to access the webinar slides. Links to these materials are also posted on the uh, Let's Grow website, along with recordings and slides from our past webinars. You can access those materials from the ASI homepage by clicking the link for the Let's Grow program materials, or you can do it also by uh, act through your UR, through your uh, web browser by directly typing in the URL www.growourflock.org. We're slated this evening for about a 45 minute presentation, followed by about 20 minutes of questions. Feel free to submit your questions at any time, including during the presentation, by typing them into the question dialog box at the bottom of your control panel, which is probably on the right hand side of your screen. At least that's where it comes up by default. Um, I'll be monitoring those questions throughout the presentation and uh, be moderating them to our speaker during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. If you have a microphone, you may also ask questions directly to the speaker during that Q&A session by raising your hand. I will go over that process in a little more detail before we start the Q&A session after the presentation is over. It is now my pleasure to formally introduce this evening's speaker, Dr. Mike Neary. Um, Dr. Neary is an extension and small ruminant specialist in the Department of Animal Sciences at uh, Purdue University in West Lafayette, Indiana. Uh, he earned a bachelor's degree here at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln on East Campus, which is where I'm currently located, so go Big Red. He also went on to get a master's of science and a PhD degree from Mississippi State University, specializing in ruminant nutrition in sheep and goats. And um, in addition to a very active uh, extension program, which he's going to be drawing on a lot of those materials here this evening and a research program, uh, Dr. Neary also takes a couple of classes there. At Purdue and applied animal management and then a, a senior level course in sheep management. So we've got a very knowledgeable person here this evening uh, with good teaching skills. So I'm really excited to have him cover this topic that uh, affects a lot of sheep producers throughout the country and that is preventing and controlling foot rot in sheep. So uh, Dr. Neary, I'm going to go ahead and turn the microphone over to you for the balance of the presentation and then I'll be back on to help moderate the Q&A session. So the floor is yours. Okay, Jay, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to participate in, in this program. Uh, looking forward to a good discussion. I uh, hope, hope what we cover is, is educational to people. And then I look forward to uh, any questions y'all might have at the end. Uh, before we get started on the topic at hand, uh, I just want to plug, I know most of y'all must be fairly tech savvy if you're participating in a webinar. so. Just want to plug a couple of things that we're doing that, that people can access remotely. Um, number The first one is uh, a podcast that we just started late last year that we try to put out monthly. Um, the topic is, the, the name of the podcast is Sheep and Goat Topics. It's available on iTunes. You can also access it on YouTube. Um, I believe it's the only educational based sheep and goat podcast that's available right now. I know that ASI has one the Sheepcast one, but that seems to be more dealing with the very important topic of legislation, legislative affairs, but this one's just complete educational in, in nature. Um, we roughly put, we put it out roughly about once a month. Uh, some of the topics we've had on it are things I think that appeal to producers like how to prevent bloat in sheep, uh, the feeding use in late gestation, uh, some of the hay issues we had last year, it looks like we're going to have again this year. 
uh, et cetera, et cetera, topics that hopefully uh, producers, um, you know, have their real world problems and I, hopefully we can help people a little bit. Also have a Facebook page, Produce Sheep and Goat Extension. Uh, you can search Facebook for it. Uh, certainly invite you to like that page. Well, hopefully you'd get some good out of that and it'd be valuable to you. And then we also have, we've had for quite a while, what we call the Produce Sheep and Goat blog, which is basically a weekly email that we send out to people that sign up for it. Um, and we have links to stories and articles that are either educational or of interest to the industry. So certainly would um, invite you to, to access those materials. We put them out hopefully to help producers and um, there you go. That'll be the end of my plugging. Okay, we'll start in on the topic at hand. And that's a, a very important topic, in my opinion, and that's foot rot. Um, it's one of the most serious diseases that, that has faced the industry and individual operations for forever, probably. Um, it's a highly contagious, very, very labor intensive disease, uh, very hard to treat, extremely hard to eradicate, and it's really been a drain on the industry. Uh, the big issue, other than individual operation problems, is it's caused producers to leave the business. Uh, it just simply wears them out. Uh, they just give up, just give up and get tired of fighting foot rot. And the easy thing to do is just to sell the sheep. And we have lost a lot of sheep through the years um, just because of foot rot. And that's, you know, that's, that's unfortunate. Um, it's very costly in terms of time and money. Uh, it costs money to treat it, costs money to control it. Uh, and then the other cost is uh, it lowers production. Uh, sheep with foot rot will have a lower body condition score. Generally, they'll have a lower body weight. They won't gain weight as well. Uh, they'll have a re reduced reproductive efficiency. And then they're more susceptible to other diseases as well. Um, and we already mentioned that it takes a lot of effort to control and it's an unforgiving disease. And, um, you know, a lot of increased labor, a lot of increased management, and there's no real return for it. I mean, you can manage your use before breeding, you can manage your use in late gestation, you can manage your lamb crop and get higher gains, but with foot rot, you're, it's all in and no out. So it's, it's, it's bad that way. And then another thing, and it's real important, I think, especially nowadays, is, is we have increased public scrutiny of our food animal production, is it's simply an, a, a humane issue. It's an animal welfare issue. And, you know, it's, it, it's a bad look People driving down the road, uh, seeing sheep out there grazing on their knees, uh, if they can see them limping and carrying their feet around, it's just a bad look. It's just, it's not a good look at all. The good news about foot rot though, uh, and what I'm gonna emphasize somewhat throughout this talk, it's a disease that's entirely preventable. And hopefully um, you'll understand what I'm talking about uh, by the time this discussion's over. All right, so what causes foot rot? Uh, the quick overview is, is it takes two anaerobic bacteria or bacteria that thrive without oxygen. Um, those are named Fusobacterium necroforum. These are hard words to say, I will tell you. And then Diclobacter nidosis. And it takes both of these anaerobic bacteria to cause foot rot. One by itself won't cause it. You combine that with environmental conditions like you know, warm weather, a lot of rain, a lot of moisture, you know, which makes mud, which makes a manure slurry. And then you throw in high animal density, <coughs> excuse me, and um, you've got a recipe for foot rot right there. This is a slide of basically what I would refer to as the big three and how it would cause foot rot. And if you look at this picture, and I'll try to use this pointer to point things out, you can see the necrotic tissue right in the interdigital cleft area between the toes, okay? Uh, but what I call the big three is there's been mud and you can see the mud clear up onto that animal's pasturing area. So they've obviously been walking and standing in a lot of moisture, a lot of mud, probably a lot of manure in there. Uh, and then you couple that with um, hooves that have not been routinely maintained um, have been neglected and not trimmed. So that that 
then you throw in the presence of those two bacteria that we visited about, uh, then you've got foot rot and it's, you know, then, then it's an issue. All right, let's talk a little bit more about the bacteria specifically, uh, because these are the keys in terms of foot rot. Uh, the Fusobacterium necroform, or the, I'm just gonna refer to it as the necroform bacteria, is a normal inhabitant of the sheep's gut, okay? So as that animal excretes manure into the environment, the environment, the farm, the, the lot, the barn, whatever it might be, the ranch, is going to be contaminated with the necroforum bacteria. Unavoidable uh, and by itself, the necroforum bacterium is not a problem, usually. Um, I'll talk a little bit later when it can be a, a somewhat of a problem. The problem bacteria in this scenario is the nidosis bacteria, okay? When it is present and it's not a normal inhabitant of the gut and it's not a normal, um, it's not, it normally doesn't live on the farm or ranch, um, but when it does get introduced to the operation and it pairs up with the necroforum bacteria, that's what re results in foot rot. Uh, there's a number of strains in the doses. There's at least 20. Uh, pretty much the same strains affect both sheep and goats. So if you have goats or sheep and you have foot problems, they both have foot problems. And conversely, Sheep can catch foot rot from goats and goats can catch foot rot from sheep. So, um, you know, there's some overlap there. Uh, the, the difference between the different strains is how virile they are, okay? The different strains, some strains will cause what's referred to as ben a benign reaction. And that's generally referred to as foot scald, which we'll show it and talk about a little bit in a minute. Uh, which is not usually a huge problem. Uh, sometimes it's self-curing. Uh, if it's not, it can be cured, you know, I will say easy, but easier. Uh, there's also strains that are kind of intermediate in terms of their activity to cause foot rot. And then there's some severe, very vir virulent strains of foot rot. And that, those types of strains are a big problem. <clears throat> so what happens with the nidosis bacteria is it secretes a protease and that's an enzyme that will actually digest the connective tissue uh, that holds the hoof together and holds the horn area of the hoof wall together. And this causes a number of problems. Uh, for one, it causes what's referred to as underrunning of the hoof horn. Uh, it digests the keratin tissue of the hoof. And then you can, foot rot has a very distinct smell due to this decaying tissue, the keratin of the hoof wall. A benign foot rot, like I mentioned just a minute ago, causes what is very commonly referred to as simply scald. Uh, and it can be caused sometimes just by necroforum or by less virulent strains of nidosis. Now this may be a year that the necroforum causing scald could possibly be a problem in some operations, mainly due to the really incredible amounts of rainfall we've had over much many parts of the country. Um, like I said, the good news about it, if it's just necroform, uh, simply running them through a foot breath once or twice generally takes care of it. And once conditions turn drier, oftentimes it'll self cure by itself. That's assuming there's no nidosis bacteria also involved. Um, scald can also be the early stages of virulent foot rot. So I'll try to, I'm, I think I've just confused everybody there, but skull can be one of two things. It can be fairly benign, maybe causing some discomfort, but not a real, real problem. Or number two, it's the first step in virulent foot rot. So it can be either one. Right, this picture shows a classic case of skull. If you look in the middle, right in that interdigital cleft, right in here, you can see that white and red tissue, uh, some hair loss. Oftentimes this area where the scald is is a little higher in moisture content. Uh, sometimes the temperature of the hoof can be a little higher due to scald. Um, and, you know, oftentimes you can smell it. Um, and like I mentioned, this could be scald with no further progression, uh, or it could be leading to virulent foot rot. 
or the first stage of it. This particular picture is leading to virulent foot rot, and you can see this dark tissue starting along the hoof wall right next to the scald, and that means that's in the early stages of virulent foot rot. So a uh, pretty classic case of scald right there. First, is, I'm sorry for this graphic picture because it is quite graphic, but it, it shows the differences very plainly. Uh, this is a very severe case of virulent foot rot. Um, you can see the underrunning and the separation of the hoof wall, basically from the base of the hoof all the way down to the toe. Um, and that gray matter in there is digested tissue, have a very distinct smell. Uh, um, you can also see where that foot rot looks like it started right in here in the base of the interdigital area. And if you look on this part here, it's black too and dark too. I would, I would suspect that that also has some decay in it as well. Um, this is a uh, this is an example of neglect, in my opinion. Uh, producers should not let their animals get this bad. It's a really bad look for the industry, and it's certainly not humane. Um, a serious animal welfare issue, but really what it does is it just highlights the real differences between scald and virulent foot rot. Okay, if you only remember a couple of things, remember these next two slides, because this is what we're gonna talk about, how to prevent foot rot, okay? And the most common means of getting foot rot introduced into a new flock, or into a, into a naive flock that has not had foot rot in the past is that they, it's bought, okay? It's bought on sheep that are infected with the, the nidosis, nidosis bacteria. Uh, there's other ways of getting it, um, but by far the most, the most common way is, is a producer buys sheep or leases a ram or commingles sheep from different operations where one operation has the nidosis, nidosis bacteria in their operation and the other one doesn't, and then it spreads to the naive animals that are not affected. Okay, if the nidosis bacteria is not present on a farm, then don't introduce it. That's, that's the simple thing about it. And it's easy to say, and it's a little harder to deal with, but sheep can be standing in knee deep mud and water. Uh, the necroform bacteria can be present, a very high population density, but if the nidosis bacteria is not present in that operation, they will not get virulent foot rot. It's just that simple. Um, the other thing that's kind of interesting and int often will try to help us control the, the foot rot bacteria is because it's an anaerobic bacteria, it only lives in the environment for about 14 days. Now some sources will say it only lives about six days, some 14. Um, I usually figure about 21 just to be safe, but you know, 14, 15, 16, you're probably okay. So it doesn't live in the environment very, very uh, well, and that's in our favor. The one thing, however, that does complicate it is it can live in sheep and goats' feet for extended periods, and those animals show no symptoms of foot rot or lameness or discomfort. Uh, where it does is it lives and survives in the cracks, the crevices, crevices uh, the folds of the hoof tissue, uh, for a number of months or longer. Uh, this allows the bacteria to, to ride out periods uh, that are not environmentally friendly for them, like dry weather, hot weather, a uh, cold weather, um, you know, lack of mud. Um, and, and the bacteria can then still be alive and still infect an operation um, because it lives up in the feet uh, of the sheep or the goat for that matter. <clears throat> excuse me, um, for a number, uh, for, for quite a while. What happens then is when conditions turn on a favorable for the bacteria, um, these she some of these sheep that are carriers that carry the, the, um, carry the bacteria, that's when they start limping. And then of course, then that's when they start infecting other animals in the, in the operation as well. Okay, so that's a couple of things about prevention that complicates things. So to prevent, if you don't have foot rot, it's really, you know, I mean, do what you want, but it's, it's sure makes life easier if you don't have it in terms of management and labor and effort. And uh, the first and 
the first thing is to try to buy or lease breeding stock from foot rot free operations. Okay. Um, the one thing about that is there's a number of producers that have fought foot rot and have had foot rot in their operation for a long time. Um, it becomes just a part of raising their animals. Uh, you know, they become, you know, used to it, I guess is a way to say it, maybe a little casual about it. Don't think it's that big a deal. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, maybe are not as concerned about it as somebody that doesn't have foot rot. So you, either an operation has foot rot or they don't have foot rot. There's nothing in the middle. If somebody says, well, if you ask them, do you have foot rot in your flock or do you have a foot rot free flock? And they say, well, well, I just have a little of it. Well, that means they have a lot of it. So they either have it or they don't have it. It's either free of foot rot or not free of foot rot. So try to buy or lease breeding stock from foot rot free operations, because as we mentioned earlier, uh, the most common way of getting it is to buy it. Uh, certainly try not to commingle as much as little as possible. And I know that's not possible for a number of people, you know, but things like being at fairs, shows, sales, things like that uh, is another place that a person can pick uh, an operation to pick up a foot rot. Um, when you do buy animals, breeding animals, or when you do bring animals home for the fair or the show or, or some other activity, um, a good strong quarantine program is really important to try to prevent introduction of foot rot um, and other diseases, of course. Uh, the sheep industry is a little behind the other food animal industries. It's been my observation in, in using strict biosecurity programs. Um, but the problem with foot rot and quarantine is if the bacteria lives up into the cracks and crevices of a sheep's feet and they become and they can be non-symptomatic, then 30 days may not be long enough. So I guess what I generally recommend is have an aggressive quarantine in terms of foot rot. That means when you get those animals home, quarantine them in a place where they have no access to other sheep or goats, um, be aggressive, trimming their feet. You can soak in a foot bath, which we'll talk about in a minute, uh, possibly even treating with antibiotics. <clears throat> Excuse me, I've had a little cold and I'm trying to get over it. Um, and the other thing that, that I've recommended to some producers is, you know, you know, their quarantine facility may be a, a really nice dry location in the barn. Uh, it might be in your best interest to, to make that environment a little more favorable for the nidosis bacteria, like introduce them to some mud and some wet and see if they break with foot rot. Uh, lastly, um, don't share trailers, don't haul animals together, don't bring animals into a facility uh, that have had infected animals in that facility for at least 14 days. So prevention is by far the best the best strategy to deal with foot rot. Uh, historically, we've controlled foot rot by a number of methods. Um, one, and let me, before I get started on that, let me say, there's been a few newer developments the last few years, which I think have been really good, that can help us in our, in our control and eradication of foot rot that I think are gonna be real industry changers. Um, but historically, this is how we've, treated foot rot. Aggressive foot trimming, very aggressive. Uh, down to the quick, open up all that tissue, try to expose everything to air since, you know, the bacteria are anaerobic uh, and, and try to prevent places where mud and manure can, can, can get in there. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about some of the new recommendations on foot trimming in a second. Uh, the use of foot baths, either a run through a foot bath or what's better is a soak with um, some type of drying agent, uh, which we will talk about also in a little more detail in a moment. Uh, vaccination, um, the vaccine has been off the market for a number of years now, and at least in the US. I know it's still available in Britain and other areas, but the company that made it decided not to market it in the US anymore. Uh, so the vaccination is not available anymore. Uh, culling, um, another cost of the operation, culling animals, uh, hope, you know, possibly in the heights of their productive years uh, that are chronic foot rot carriers and, and chronic problems. A uh, pasture facility management, whether it be rotation, uh, trying to keep conditions dry, et cetera. And then 
Lastly, and probably most importantly, is the use of antibiotics. And traditionally, the antibiotic of choice has been oxytetracycline, which is more commonly known as either LA-200 or LA-300, uh, has been really the drug of choice. I'm gonna to try to highlight some of these newer findings in the next few slides. Okay, the primary method, it used to be the primary means of dealing with foot rot was aggressive trimming followed by foot bathing. Um, some to some, you know, limited success. Now it's recommended that the primary method of the control and eradication of foot rot is based on the use of antibiotics. Um, the most important strategy is to use some type of antibiotics, and we'll talk about a couple here in a minute. Uh, oxytetracycline, a very useful one, uh, very reasonably effective, uh, can really bring a lot of relief to animals and can help and control the foot rot. Um, we don't use it so much in this country, uh, use of, an antibiotic spray uh, to spray in that interdigital area of the hoof, especially in the terms of scald or some some intermediate or less severe foot rot, uh, but they use it a lot in Britain. Uh, and of course, that's real, what's real important is if you do use the spray, you gotta keep that hoof dry after application so they don't just wash it off going back in the mud or going onto some dew covered grass. But the newest and most exciting development, I think one of the more exciting developments in the last few years in the sheep industry has been um, the finding that gamethyl gamethromycin, or what's referred to as Zactran, uh, made and marketed by Zoetis is extremely effective in eliminating foot rot. Um, I think it's got a chance to really change the industry in a positive manner in terms of controlling this really draining disease. Uh, the problem with um, Zactran right now, and it's been on, it's on back order, um, and it's been on back order for quite a while now. Um, some vets will still have a supply of it, but to order more, at least as of last week, um, um, Zach Trend was on back order. Hopefully that'll come back onto the market pretty soon. I just want to hit on the next few slides. I just want to talk about a, 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 an experiment, a series of experiments, a series of studies that were done over in Europe that really highlighted the uh, efficacy of Zach Trend against foot rot. Um, they were reported by Strobel and coworkers in the veterinary record, I, I believe it was in 2014. Uh, a, a, uh, the results of a series of experiments that they did as, a, uh, as gamma is as, as Zactran as a possible antibiotic. Uh, Zactran is an antibiotic that's in this country and it's historically been used to treat cattle with respiratory issues. Now that's good news in terms of the back order in my, in my opinion because that means there's a broad market for the disease. I mean for the antibiotic, excuse me, there's a broad market for the antibiotic which means that the likelihood that it'll come back on the market and, and come out of and back into production is probably increased because there's also a market for cattle, uh, which is of course a, a you know a large and economically important uh, enterprise in the country. It's not approved for use in sheep in the U.S. without a veterinarian prescription. Uh, it is labeled in Europe for foot rot control in sheep, but this is always so frustrating about sheep. But like so many other products. Like, the to like in Europe, they have a toxoplasmosis vaccine, which I sure wish we had here. Uh, in other parts of the world, they have combination drenches, which, are, which have been approved, but they're not approved in the US, uh, although they are approved in other major sheep producing countries. Um, so you're gonna have to get a script to use it. Um, just to kind of highlight of some of the results they found, uh, the first project that they reported used 10 flocks of sheep located in southern Germany. And what they did was compare Zactran to control foot rot to our traditional use of oxytetracycline or LA-200. Um, they actually scored the feet of the sheep uh, where the lower the number, the better in terms of foot rot. Uh, a zero was a normal foot dry between the toes, uh, not, a, you know, not an increase in temperature, no signs of scald and or foot rot. A one was you know inflammation, hair loss, Hoof temperature, hoof temperature was elevated. Uh, number two probably was either a two or three was that first picture we showed uh, where there's, you see some necrosis of the skin. You can smell it. A three, you start seeing underrunning. And then of course five was necrosis to the hoof tip and 
hoof separation, which would have been an example of the last picture we showed of foot rot. So what they did was on the first day of the project, they went through and inspected all the sheep's feet. They gave them a foot score, the what we just talked about, and then they were they were randomly group treated with either LA200 or Zactran. At day 21, they brought the sheep back in and re-inspected and re-scored those animals to see to see the effect. And uh, then on day two, which would have been 21 days later again, they did a final foot inspection. And this is just hitting the real high points here, but I think it's it'll get the point across. The results from their inspection on day 21, they got a 79% cure rate for the use of oxytetracycline, which is which is pretty strong, pretty good. Uh, however, they got a 93% cure rate for the use of gamethamycin or Zactran. Uh, the sheep that still had problems were retreated or re-injected with antibiotics. And then at day 42, the last inspection day, they had a 99% cure rate with Zactran, which is just really impressive. I mean, to me, that's really exciting. Another part of their study was is they used a a large field study using Zactran on a whole flock basis. The first, they used a German flock that had a very high prevalence of foot rock, anywhere from 20 to 80 percent, depending on the year. Uh, they used about 184 sheep. They scored the sheep on day one, just like the other one. Um, of the 184, a, a majority, 117 of them, had some hoof issue. They were at least a one or higher, and a big, uh, you know a significant amount, 98, were the three or higher. So all sheep, regardless of their foot score, were treated with Zactran. On day 23, all the sheep were rechecked. Eight were still lame, <coughs> and those were retreated. Now that's pretty impressive. Out of 117 sheep and one injection of Zactran, there was only eight lame sheep after three weeks. Any of the any of you that have fought foot rot knows that's 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 impressive. Uh, on day forty five, uh, rechecked no lame sheep. That specific operation remained free of foot rot for at least eighteen months. At which time they they quit monitoring it. Again, that's very exciting. Um, another part of their study was using forty eight flocks in in Denmark with a total of 9,000 sheep. So it wasn't just a small, small uh, part-time project. This was a big undertaking uh, with an average foot rot prevalence of 32%, which is probably pretty typical of an operation that has foot rot. Uh, again, they did a whole flock treatment with Zactran, re-inspected it a month, re-inspected it six months. And of the 48 flocks, 44 of those flocks remained free of foot rot for more than a year. And then also again at two years. And the authors in the study cited that possibly the four that didn't remain free introduced the bacteria back into their flock again, which there's a lesson there. Uh, in conclusion, the authors of this study uh, said that gamithromycin could be used to eradicate foot rot. And that's, a, you know, no hoof trimming, no vaccines, no separating the flock, you know, just a simple injection of Zactran cured foot rot. Uh, to me, that was a big, big finding, a big, big development. Now, you know, the bad news is, is like a lot of the drugs we have available to us now, whether it be human drugs and or animal drugs, it's a very expensive. Uh, and like I mentioned earlier, it's on back order. Um, I do assume it'll be back on the market. Uh, however, I have no idea for sure, and I don't know when. Um, one thing about using Zactran that I worry about is that producers will overuse it. Uh, start to kind of live with foot rot and when it gets really bad, just use Zactran uh, to keep it controlled. Uh, it's best used as a complete eradication tool, not as a routine treatment. So I guess what I'm saying is producers get sick of fighting foot rot. They want to get rid of it, plan a schedule, plan a program, use Zactran, to eradicate foot rot from the operation and then tighten up the management where you don't reintroduce the nidosis bacteria back into your flock. Um, you know, we want to limit the use of these antibiotics for a number of factors. Uh, you know, for one is, uh, you know, the bacterial resistance to that particular uh, antibiotic. 
certainly could be down the road a problem, mainly would be due to overuse of it. And then, of course, you know, there's a human health significance as well. And then, of course, it's expensive. It's a very expensive drug to use. Um, generally, what I recommend to producers, because of the expense and, and also to try to, to attempt to limit the use of the antibiotic and the exposure of the antibiotic to um, the bacterial population, is to try to time the eradication or the drug use program um, at the point in the production cycle when the sheep numbers on the operation are at their lowest number. That's generally going to be after weaning, after the lambs are sold, you know, maybe it'd be late gestation, uh, sometime, bef you know, sometime when the, when the numbers on the farm or ranch are at the very lowest uh, is the most effective way. And also probably the, the cheapest way to use this um, as, a, as a method to eradicate foot rot. And then of course, I'll say it one more time, then, you know, do everything you can not to reintroduce the nidosis bacteria to the flock, back into the flock. All right, I want to talk a little bit about foot baths because uh, they certainly are a useful aid to try to control and or to eradicate foot rot. Uh, by themselves, they'll just kind of help control it. It's hard to eradicate with it. Uh, but along with antibiotics, um, foot baths, can, are st I think they're still valuable. Uh, what a foot bath is is simply a solution. It's, some, it's a drying agent put into a solution. And the most common um, agents, drying agents used are kind of in order of how I pers personally like them is one zinc sulfate. Um, the reason I like zinc sulfate better is number one, it goes into solution easier than copper sulfate. Uh, it stays in solution longer than copper sulfate. Uh, it's, it, it can be corrosive, but it's not as corrosive as copper sulfate. Uh, it won't turn your clothes green. Uh, Etc. And then of course you've got the whole copper issue in sheep as well too. Uh, copper sulfate is fine. It's a good, it's a good drying agent. It's an effective drying agent. But for the reasons I just mentioned, I think zinc sulfate's better. Now I know a number of people that have, have small flocks uh, and maybe just a few animals with with foot rot will use a copper sulfate type of like a squirt bottle or a solution to individually uh, treat hooves and in uh, interdigital areas, you know, with, with those solutions, and that's fine. It's, they're good products. Uh, the last one's formaldehyde. Um, generally, I don't recommend this one. Uh, it's, it is a known carcinogen, um, and it also really hardens the hoof tissue. So if you do use formaldehyde in the foot baths, and then you go back to do routine foot trimming later, it really gets to be a job because those hooves are really hard, not to mention it gives some people a really bad headache too. So um, foot baths are, are valuable. Um, and that's, I guess, the drying agents I recommend, kind of in order of how I'd recommend them. Uh, as you're making up a foot rod, a couple of things to try to keep things in, in emulsified is simply just put some type of soap or detergent in the solution. Uh, it'll help. What it'll do is it'll help get the, uh, the agent into solution. It'll also help keep it in solution, keep it in suspension. Uh, foot baths are most effectively used early in the disease progression, especially with just minor cases of scald, uh, maybe some milder cases of foot rot, uh, and they can be pretty effective in those cases. Not near as effective in the more severe cases, simply because it's hard for um, that solution to get up into the tissue where a lot of the uh, bacteria live. But still, foot baths are useful. Couple more things about foot baths. Um, there's basically two ways to use a foot bath. One's just a run through foot bath where you just simply run them down the race. You know, there's foot bath, you know, there's foot baths with a solution in the race. Uh, the sheep are, are, you know, walking, running through there. They get the solution on their feet. Hopefully they get it up in between their toes. Uh, the other is to stand those animals either into a race or into some other container that'll hold water and make them stand there and soak. And soaking is more effective than running them through. Uh, you get more exposure, you get more exposure up into that interdigital area, and um, generally it's just more effective. Uh, you get more penetrance. Uh, generally, if you're, you're soaking, it depends on the severity of the issue in the operation, but usually two to three times per week, at least about 10 minutes per soak. 
Now, whether you're using a, a run-through foot bath or a soaking type of foot bath, um, if at all possible, ideally, you'll have those animals in, remain on a dry area until their hooves dry, uh, so the solution just doesn't get washed off you know, through the morning dew on the grass or going through mud or water. This is just an example of, we, we have a station in Southern Indiana where we have hares, sheep, and goats. We had some issues with our goats. And this is the device the guys at the farm came up with, an old, kind of an old plastic crate. If it'll hold water, and if it'll hold sheep, it can be used as a foot soaking device. And if it'll hold these goats, it'll hold sheep. So this was actually pretty good. It worked pretty well for us. All right, the next topic that's been a little bit new in developing and, and controlling foot rot is the whole topic of foot trimming. And I mentioned earlier, it used to be recommended to be very aggressive in trimming hooves, uh, trying to open that tissue up, introduce oxygen, et cetera. Um, more recently, especially out of Britain, uh, animal health experts have, a, have a, new, a new way of looking at this and a new way of due to a couple of studies uh, that they recommend not trimming hooves at the time of antibiotic treatment and or use of foot baths. Uh, for several reasons. One, it can spread foot rot to those animals that don't already have it through the use of the you know, equipment. Uh, probably two, maybe more importantly, is it can damage the integrity of the hoof, uh, which increases complications, which you know, increases, the you know, increases the time of healing, and it simply delays healing from the antibiotic treatment and the foot bathing, and foot bathing routine. Somewhere between, in my opinion, no trimming and aggressive trimming lies probably the reasonable approach. Um, first, if you, producers will bring in their animals with foot rot, treat them with antibiotic, and if they do have overgrown hooves, come back five, six, seven days later and, and, and go ahead and just trim, carefully trim the excessive growth off of those hooves. Not the aggressive trimming, but just trim the excessive growth, you know, the folds and the overrunning and things like that. Taking particular care to leave the hoof wall and the sole of the foot intact. <clears throat> and then if you are worried about uh, further spreading foot rot, uh, simply disinfect those hoof shears between uh, sheep. This is a picture of a trimmed goat foot. There's a reason I'm showing this is, um, if you think about a sheep, they've got eight toes, four feet, eight toes, and that holds the entirety of their body weight, whether they're 60 pounds or 300 pounds, those eight toes. And of those toes, the structure that holds their weight and allows them to be mobile and stand normally is, is the two structures po pointed out here. One is the hoof wall, which is the wide area, and then one is the big area, the more kind of a flexible area called the sole. And those are the structures that, that lead to the integrity of the hoof and allow them to have a normal standing and walking. So I guess what I'm saying is when hoof trimming, uh, whether it's routine hoof trimming or whether it's careful hoof trimming uh, due to foot rot problems, try if at all possible to leave these two structures intact uh, so that you know, it doesn't delay healing and actually cause more problems. All right, let's talk a little bit about con just controlling foot rot on a on a on a day to day or week to week basis. Uh, like we mentioned, it's based on antibiotic treatment and foot soaking. Those are the two best weapons to try to control foot rot. We'll talk about eradication in a minute. Um, until we get Zactran back on the market, you're going to have to use oxytetracycline which is effective, it's just not as effective. Um, gonna have to do a little judicious foot trimming, uh, foot soaking, like I mentioned, and then of course, culling. So these are the old methods, and that's what we're gonna have to use until um, Zactran or Gimithromycin becomes available. If you wanna eradicate foot rot, and I mean, I'm the sheep specialist in the farm flock state, so we have a big wide variety of, of operation sizes here, a lot of smaller flocks. Um, and when people call me or email me about foot rot, 
you know, I'll give them this option because it's a very, very, very effective option. And that is, if you just can't get rid of it, just sell them all. Take them to the sale barn, get rid of them. If you still want sheep, wait about three weeks and restock with clean animals, animals that don't have the nidosis bacteria. That is a very effective way of getting rid of foot rot. Um, there is, of course, a cost to it because you're generally not going to you're not going to make that work financially, uh, and it's not always practical. I understand that if somebody has valuable breeding stock, that's not a practical method, but in some cases it is practical and is very effective. If that isn't practical, if it's not feasible, then first to try to eradicate it, uh, get all the animals together, run them through the working facility, check the feed on all the animals in the herd. Any animal that shows any sign of foot rot and or scald, separate, segregate into their own, uh, into their own group. Uh, thirdly, run the clean animals through a foot bath and segregate them to a pasture or a lot or an area that has not had sheep on it for at least four, or goats for at least 14 days. Because if you remember, the bacteria does not live in the environment for more than about 14 days. As the process goes along, any clean animals that start to show symptoms like limping or you know other common symptoms of foot rot, take them and put them in with the infected group. The infected group then you can put most of your efforts onto. You can treat them with antibiotics. You know you can keep their feet trimmed judiciously, uh, regular foot soaking. Um, you know. Zinc sulfate two to three times a week, like we mentioned earlier, for 10 to 20 minutes. Um, and hopefully some of those animals will start getting better. Some of them will start getting better. As those animals do start getting better or, and you know, are non-symptomatic and, and don't show scald or foot rot as you examine their feet, uh, make a third area to put those animals in. Don't put them in with the clean ones right away. Uh, remove them to a third location that has been, again, vacant for about 14 days. So you'll have three groups of sheep, a clean group, um, uh, a group that was infected and hopefully is cured, and then a group that's still infected and still showing foot rot problems. Usually, there's gonna be some that you just can't get clean. Um, you know, especially if, you, if you've, you know, adhere to all the details and all the effort and all the treatment and all the foot soaking and there's some that just won't clear up those are animals that just need to be called from the operation they're the carriers they're the ones that initially spread it when you get a break of foot rot um, that's a lot of work to do it's a lot of expense to do um, and i guess hopefully it's it highlights the real value in trying to put a lot of effort into preventing foot rot in the first place. Cause so you don't have to go through all that mess, all that expense and all that work without a guaranteed hundred percent sure you'll get it done because you know, all it takes is one break. All right, let's talk about eradication of foot rot when Zach Trenton comes back onto the market. So the way that is gonna work, and I hopefully this will be a little easier, uh, a little less work, just like they showed in those studies, uh, do a whole flock treatment with Zactran, every animal in the flock. Uh, still inspect all the sheep. Uh, I would recommend those sheep that do have foot problems, segregating them, um, use a foot bath on them, foot soak, uh, and move them to clean pasture for a while because you want to reinspect those in about three weeks, just like they did on that research study. Okay, they'll reinspect the sheep 20 days later. Any Animals that still have some signs of foot rot, retreat them with the antibiotic, uh, reinspect them again 21 days after that, which would be day 42. Any of them are still affected at that point, call them. Just get rid of them because they're going to be hard to get rid of. Uh, of course, you're going to have to be aware of the withdrawal dates on those particular drugs. As far as Zactran, you're going to have to work with a veterinarian on a script, <coughs> on the correct dosage and withdrawal time for Zactran. When this first came out, I know some veterinarians were, I'll just make a mention of this right now, were hesitant to uh, prescribe this to sheep producers. And what I was doing with our producers was basically sending them the URL 
that showed the results of the study that we talked about a little bit ago and let them read it and draw their own conclusions because it wasn't a peer-reviewed uh, journal. You know, it was good science. It wasn't just happenstance. I mean, they used thousands of sheep to prove their point there. So that all, usually was adequate and they could get the drug prescribed to them. So you're gonna have to work with a vet on it. Um, generally the dosage is the same dosage per 100 pounds that they recommend for cattle, uh, but you'll for sure wanna get a withdrawal uh, script on that and especially a withdrawal script. And I mentioned this earlier, treat when the sheep numbers on the farm are at their lowest point. Uh, and after treating them with the Zactran, try to put them on a clean pasture an area that hasn't had sheep or goats on it with foot rot for at least 14 days to try to prevent reinfection, even though there is some residual effect of the drug in the, but still I think it'd just be, um, be smart to do that. And then the big one, once you do this and you get a clean flock, really, really up your efforts to try to prevent the reinduction of uh, the, the doses bacteria. Uh, kind of want to mention this because I do think it's important. It's just kind of random in here, but it is important. There is a genetic component to foot rot susceptibility. Um, some animals are more susceptible to foot rot uh, and some are more resistant. Um, it may be due to the shape of their sh uh, hoof. It may be the conditions in their interdigital area. Could be hoof color. You know, nobody really knows for sure. Uh, the other thing about it is it may res affect their response to treatment. Those that are maybe a little more resistant get a little milder case of it uh, if they get it and respond to treatment quicker as well. So there is a genetic uh, factor. Um, there's a known breed effect. Um, it's pretty well, pretty well considered that Merino derived breeds tend to be a little more susceptible than other breeds. Although there's many breeds that are susceptible to foot rot, that's for sure. Uh, depending on what source you look at, um, there's a heritability of 0.1 to 0.3, um, depending on the source and the project and the review articles, uh, probably affected by breed. Um, um, the one thing about that is those would be low, pretty much lowly heritable, maybe reaching up into uh, moderately heritable. Um, but you look at things like prolificacy, it's about a 10% or 0.1 heritability. Uh, we all select for twins. So it is something certainly worth selecting for uh, natural resistance to foot rot. <laughs> and really the only way you can do this is to by keeping records, keeping detailed records on who breaks first, who doesn't get affected by foot rot, et cetera. I will wrap it up here. Just wanna cover some of the high points again. Um, foot rot extremely costly disease to individual operations and to the industry on a whole. If at all possible, do not introduce the dedosis bacteria to your operation. Don't buy it, don't lease it, don't pick it up commingling, don't pick it up at the fair. Um, just if It just will simplify your life tremendously. Um, if you do get new animals, if you do take animals out and bring them back home, quarantine them. Uh, give it an aggressive quarantine. Uh, try to find it if it's there. Uh, treat animals that are introduced like they have foot rot. Uh, do some routine foot trimming. Uh, do try to keep the environment clean and dry if it, as much as possible. And I know that's easy to say and often hard to do. Uh, some random summaries, foot soaking, more effective than foot bathing, although foot bathing is, is not bad, but it's just not quite as, just not quite as, as thorough as the soaking. Uh, eradication certainly can be eased and used, you know, much more effectively through the use of, of the gamethromycin uh, antibiotics or Zactran. Just mentioned the genetic percent propensity to foot rot. And then the last thing I'll say is, you know, just ethically and morally, you know, try not to sell foot rot exposed animals to other breeders, or if you, you know, do have them for sale, be upfront and say, hey, you know, this is the situation, we have foot rot. It may or may not be an issue with that other operation, but if it is, they'll be glad to know it and they'll think highly of you for it. Uh, with that, I'll answer any questions. Jay? Yeah, thanks, Mike. That's a lot of information. We've had a lot yeah, of questions. Sorry. No, that's good. We've had a lot of... 
a lot of questions. This cold I got about killed me there. So. Yeah, a lot of questions came in while you were talking. I'll, some of them okay. repetitive, and I'll try to group them together. So the first thing I want to take care of is the dosage. You mentioned the dosage for Zactran, if I heard you right there, but we've also got right. questions on LA200. So you just okay. want to repeat the dosage for Zactran and then compare it to well, the dosage for LA200. I would say on the dosage for Zactran, you need to talk to your veterinarian about that. Generally, it's the same dosage that's used on a body weight basis for cattle has been my experience with the producers out, you know, out in the country that have used it. Uh, but again, it's not an approved drug for sheep. So that's, uh, you know, that's an issue that needs to be talked with your veterinarian. They can do a little research on it. They can make an informed recommendation. Uh, they can also make an informed recommendation on withdrawal times. That way you've got a script you're not using that drug off label. You're using it, you know. You're using you're using it under the direction of a veterinarian. As far as the LA two hundred, uh, generally you just give that at about the same rate you normally would for um, for respiratory issues, which is um, which is included on the label. And let's see, for the LA two hundred, that's about four and a half mils per hundred pounds of body weight, and for the LA three hundred, it's three mils. But all of that's on the label or on the insert, and it'll also give you withdrawal time as well. Okay, and then on the foot bath, somebody asked a formula uh, for the zinc sulfate foot bath soaking method. How many grams or pounds of zinc sulfate per gallon of water? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, generally, it's recommended 10% weight per volume. And that what that works out to be is about eight pounds of the zinc sulfate per 10 gallons of water. Okay. Um, all right, then we had some general questions come in, so I'll move to those and then we'll come back through some of those uh, drug questions. But uh, can a flock be certified foot rot free? Uh, not that I know of in this country. Uh, I think it's possible in other countries, but not I know of in this country. That's a really good idea, though. Um, I don't know if there's the funding and the, you know, the effort, but that would be a really good idea. And I would certainly be a marketing ploy for people that go to the trouble of uh, keeping their operation. And, and it, you know, it takes some management and some attention to detail to, to, to keep foot rot out of the operation. And that certainly would be a way to, to uh, pay. But no, not to my knowledge. I don't know that. Okay. I don't, I don't believe so. All right. It's, it's a good idea, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> some people are asking about the pastures. Are there any treatments recommended to kill off nidosis from pasture? No. Um, I mean, I know people use things like lime, uh, drying agents around, not pastures so much, but say like around watering troughs where, you know, you tend to get some, you know, buildup of moisture. Uh, other areas like feed bunks where you get some buildup of moisture. Um, and that can certainly help and it makes the environment more, you know, better for the sheep or, and worse for the bacteria. But if that's your only way of trying to control it, you're fighting a losing battle there, um, because it, it it just it it just it's just not strong enough, and it's an, it, it would be impractical and probably ineffective to try to treat the pasture with some sort of drying agent. Okay, and, and some, expensive. Okay, and a couple of well, similar question. How many months? Uh, let's see. Make sure I got this right question. Okay. Oh, once you have a clean herd and it shows back up, but you have not brought in any new stock or anything, and you've not gone to the stockyards or anything, how, how does this show back up? Is a question basically. <laughs> okay, okay. If you if you think okay, I, if I understand the question right, which I think I do, mm -hmm. um, if you have treated and tried to eradicate, and you think you've won the battle. But it comes back up, say in a few months' time, and you've you know you've had a closed flock, closed operations, and I'm assuming you didn't track it in on your boots, or you didn't share a trailer with somebody, or something like that. Uh, then what you did, what you, what you had in that case is you truly didn't have a clean flock. You had some individuals in that flock that still had the nidosis bacteria living up in their feet. Generally, in that case, you know you've had an environment that's not conducive to the propagation of that bacteria, whether it be winter time and cold weather, whether you've had a stretch of dry weather, uh, et cetera. So that's what makes it tough 
when you get it in your operation, even though it's fairly easily eliminated from the living environment by just leaving it you know, free of animals for a couple of weeks, it's a lot more difficult to completely eradicate it from those cracks and crevices and those folds of the sheep's hoof. Uh, that's why prevention is so important because you never know for sure you, you know, you've got it, if that makes sense. Okay, and um, along those same lines, somebody was saying, well, the question was how long can an animal be a carrier, but the example might be better. They're saying um, you have a ewe with scald. At what point can you be fairly certain it is not virulent strain and just scald? Uh huh. Yeah. Well, if it that's a really good question, especially this year. Um, with an, you know, I don't. People are from all the country on this webinar. I know, but you know, I know there's some areas in the southeast where it's actually been dry. But most of the areas of the country, at least you know, the farm flock states and even some of the other western states, we have just unbelievable amount of rain this spring and winter. Um, and like I mentioned in the presentation, sometimes the necroforum bacteria can cause scald without going into being full-fledged foot rot. So that's a good question. Um, I would say, you know, if you, number one, if you get case like that, you know, try to improve their environment as much as practical. And I know it's difficult. It is difficult. Um, but if you could run them through a foot bath um, or even soak them for a little while in a foot rat bath and it clears up quickly, it's probably just scald. If it doesn't, you know, in a, in a week or two later, you start getting, you know, further cases, further eroding of the tissue, then you know it's, it's um, the skull is just not a benign form, it's just the precursor to the virulent form. Okay, and we have a question from this coming from other species, cattle in particular, whether cattle can carry it and transfer it or wildlife, uh, anything you can add there in terms of information on where it might come from another species? Um, it won't come from cattle. I mean, cattle have foot rot, of course, um, and I'm not as much expert on that as I am on sheep and goats. But, but I do know that cattle, you know, they have they have more of benign strains of foot rot than sheep and goats do. It's not near as much of a problem. Generally, we don't consider it as big a pro. I don't consider it a cross contamination problem. Generally, it's a necroforum based um, type foot rot, and it can cause a little bit of problems in sheep or goats, but it's, but it's usually self curing. As far as other wildlife, that's a really good question, and I'll just be honest, I'm not sure, but I would I would think possibly deer could carry it, um, or other ungulates like that with, you know, that are that are somewhat related to sheep and goats, but I'm not positive about that. Okay, thanks, and that was basically what the question was, I thought it was from deer mm -hmm. when it came back in. Yeah, 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 I mean a real, you know, you know, a lot of deer around. Okay, and of course, several people are asking about the Zactran. Um, uh, I'll just call it preventative things. People along the lines of, uh, uh, were any sheep in your study in particular, were any sheep preemptively treated with Zactran or has that been looked at or do you recommend that at all? I'm, I'll let you answer the question. I think I know what you're gonna say. But <laughs> what, do you, what do you mean preemptively treated? <laughs> Um, basically, uh, can you give them a dose when they come off the truck? What do you think you might have something coming on? <laughs> well, actually, I would I would think that'd be a smart move. Okay. Um, you know, now I'm not saying to treat if you buy a hundred ewes from somebody and they say they're a foot rot free flock. I, I wouldn't recommend treating a hundred ewes that way. Well, for one, it'd be doggone expensive. The other, it'd be probably a, a misuse of, of the antibiotic. But if you're just buying a ram mm -hmm. or, you know, a couple of sheep um, and as part of the quarantine program, you know, you trim their hooves, you expect their feet, you, know, you soak them in a foot bath, you know, I, I don't think it'd be a bad idea to give them a shot of Zactran. But that's a limited usage and not a, not a wholesale just throwing it out there like paint on the wall, which I think is Knowing sheep producers like I do, you know, that's the thing that worries me, that, that people will overuse that drug, just like we've overused dewormers through the years, and then we'll run into issues down the road and we'll be right back where we started. So I would just say use the drug judiciously um, 
and use it when you need it and use it as an eradication tool um, and then tighten up your management from there. That's my best advice. Okay, and switching to LA200, uh, somebody asked about a spray form of it, if that exists, and somebody else asked or said that they were told to just spread it on the foot and that that would be effective. Um, okay, the spray form, they use that, I think I said this in the talk, they use that quite a bit over in Britain, and Britain has a lot worse problem with foot rots than we do even in this country, mainly, you know, of course they have a very conducive environment for it with all the wet weather and the warmth and uh, plus they're, the way they run sheep, the way they manage their sheep, there's a lot of common grazing areas. So they tend to have a much higher prevalence of foot rot even than, than we do in this country. Uh, and, and using an antibiotic spray is one of, their, one of their fairly, you know, reasonably effective methods of trying to control foot rot. Um, generally it's an oxytetracycline spray um, and it can be reasonably effective on things like scald or maybe minor foot rot but if you've got if you've got a you know an infection pretty deep into the hoof it's not near as infective it just won't get in there um, where you'd get that I'm not sure in this country to be honest with you I uh, probably could do some googling and see if you can find it already in solution um, I don't know many people over here that use the antibiotic spray uh, but I do know the second part of that question, a number of producers that do use just a direct application of say oxytetracycline onto the infected hoof area. I think that would, you know, to me that would be similar, um, but not as effective as actual injecting them with it. I would certainly want to inject them at the recommended dosage with the drug and then as an addition, um, treat the interdigital area with, with the, uh, the liquid itself and then, of course, you'll really want to try to use your best efforts to keep that hoof dry as possible. Okay. And some questions on just disinfecting. Um, what disinfectant can be used on hoof tremors? And then the same, somebody else asked a similar question in terms of boot, people's boots and stuff like that. What's the best thing? Okay, as far as the hoof tremors, you know, just a general, you know, something like a Novasan or some sort of a disinfectant, I think, would be certainly better than what we usually do, which is nothing. Uh, it's been my experience through the years. Um, so, you know, just a good general disinfectant. Um, as far as, you know, you know, boots, rubber boots, you know, plastic boots. I've been to a lot of sheep producers farms through the years and goat producers farms. And only once or twice have I ever been asked to to wear plastic boots. We just don't do it like we probably should do it, like the swine industry does and other industries do. Um, you know, I, I think that's probably, especially if you have a closed flock, you know, especially if you have valuable animals or productive animals uh, and you don't have num a number of these diseases that can cause just a real management headache, probably a good idea to incorporate that into your biosecurity program. You know, limiting visitors and when they do come on the place, you know, with appropriate footwear would go a long ways for a lot of problems. Okay. Um, and some foot bath questions. Somebody just asked a generic question of uh, how do you get the animals to go in there? They they claim their sheep would die before you got them to go through that. <laughs> yeah, that's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> that is a problem. Um, you know, uh, you know, one is the layout and the and the design of the facility will help. Um, and two, you know, sometimes you just got to use a little bit of brute force um, and just, you know, pretty much force them in there. Uh, they don't like to stand in in you know zinc sulfate or copper sulfate solution with water. I don't I don't guess I blame them. I wouldn't either. Um, you're just going to have to find some way to, you know, get them in there. That's again, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work, a lot of effort. And if you don't, if you can prevent it, you don't have to go through all that work and all that effort. So. Okay, good. Um, somebody asked about uh, LA200 in particular, but they asked if they're safe during breeding season on rams. They had a vet um, tell them that it's, it causes sterility. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, there has been some work and some reports that, that oxytetracycline can have a negative effect on rams. Um, so that would certainly be a consideration uh, if you're using that particular product. 
you know, especially, you know, six to eight weeks out, you know, out from breeding, you know, from breeding season and or during breeding season. Okay. And somebody said treating the whole flock, does that include the lambs also? Well, that's why, I, yes, it does. It does because they can sure carry skull. They can sure carry foot rot. They certainly, they pick it up from their mothers and, you know, their aunts and their other, the other animals in the pens. So if you're going to use that gamethromycin method, you, you basically it's recommended you treat all the animals if you're trying to eradicate it and then come back 21 days later and inspect and treat anybody else, you know, anybody that needs another shot. So that's why I said during the presentation, you know, use that as an eradication tool. And as part of the eradication program, you need to do some planning and try to use it when the fewest number of sheep are on the particular farm. And that's generally after the lambs are sold or moved to another operation or moved to another, you know, another farm. Um, one, you know, there's fewer animals exposed to the antibiotic. And two, a big one is it's a lot cheaper because that's an, it's an, you know, like most of the drugs nowadays, it's, you know, it's pricey. I mean, most of these newer drugs are pricey. Okay. Uh, somebody asked a question about foot vax. Uh, any merit in there or any comments you want to share on that? Well, that's been off the market for a number of years um, in the in this country. It's still available in other countries, but it's been my understanding that, you know, the company quit marketing here. Just the industry is small enough. They did. I don't, I don't know the reasons, but, um, but it was used a lot at one time. I guess I wasn't as excited about it as some people, although some people thought it worked pretty well. Um, you know, the vaccination itself, it's not like a vaccination like you're, like you'd be vaccinating for say a clostridial disease where you get, you know, almost a hundred percent protection and a prevention. It doesn't do that. You can't vaccinate a sheep with the foot rot vaccine and they're completely protected from foot rot. That's just not the way that vaccine worked. Uh, what it did was it helped, along with other treatment programs, if they were affected, it helped them get cleared up quicker, and it did have some resistance to, uh, you know, to them getting it, but it, it's more of an aid than it is a prevention, if that makes sense. Um, the problem with the vaccine was, is it only covered eight strains of the nodosis vaccine, and then, like I mentioned, there's like 20, so you may not be even protecting against the particular strain or strains that are affecting a specific operation. And the one thing I really didn't like about the vaccine is it was kind of a nasty vaccine to use. It was hard on the sheep. It left a big abscess. They had to have an injection and then followed up booster. And it was, it's, it's just a hard vaccine on them. And, and I didn't think it was, it had its place. It had some, it had some, um, had some, some, you know, quite useful in some way, in some areas, but it certainly had limitations. Um, not as good as antibiotic treatment, especially with the Zactrin um, development in the last couple of years. Okay, um, from Oregon, we had a question on some research being done by of adding cell coat to fertilizer. Have you heard anything about that at all uh, being done in other parts of the country? I don't know if that's selenium or not. They put cell coat in parentheses here. Well, um, I mean, there's a number of, okay, anything that leads to a better hoof structure and a healthy hoof will help in the fight against foot rot, okay? You know, whether it be your zinc levels in your ration or in your mineral, uh, whether it be a good nutrition program, you know, whether it be an environment that, you know, pr promotes, you know, less of a chance for injuries or abscesses, et cetera, uh, will aid and help some. But if you get the nodosis bacteria from a virulent strain, you're going to have foot rot. Okay, so that's the real key is keeping that out of your flock. Other things are great, and they're good, and they're good management practices, but it gets right down to it. If, if they get that nodosis bacteria and it's a strain that causes virulent action, you're going to have foot rot. It's, it's unfortunate, but it's the truth. Um, and I'd like to say one thing about hoof problems. Just because a sheep's limping doesn't mean they necessarily have foot rot. There's a number of other things that cause hoof problems in sheep and goats. You know, they might sprain an ankle. You know, they might get an injury. Um, they can get foot abscesses, whether it be like a stone bruise that develops into an abscess. So there's a number of things that cause sheep 
to limp, hopefully temporarily, uh, just because they're limping and you have the odd one that limps doesn't mean they have foot rot. Um, you know, you need to inspect them and treat them and deal with it on a case by case basis before you, you know, throw the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak. Okay, um, well, we're running up against the time here. I'm just going to ask you a couple more questions. We did have a flood question come in, and so I feel obligated to ask that. Can bacteria be carried and deposited by flood water, causing a flock to become infected? I'm not positive, but I would say unlikely. Okay. Um, and then uh, is the FusoGuard vaccination for cattle a waste of money for sheep? I think it is. Okay. But others might differ with that, but I think it is. Okay. Because that, that, that covers the strain. That's more of the necroform strains. Uh, it's not going to hurt. Um, it's going to cost money, and of course, uh, but I, I don't, the, the way to prevent foot rot is not to introduce the nodosis. I'm sorry, I've said this like a thousand times, but it's the truth. Mm -hmm. Don't let that nodosis bacteria get into your flock. That's how you deal with it. Okay, and then the last question is uh, with foot baths, uh, bringing new animals into the flock. Uh, they just wanted some clarification on they, whether they should be running them through a foot bath or making them soak, and then how many treatments are there, how often, what should they be doing with new animals coming in if they're using foot baths? Um, you know, if at all possible, soak. Um, and I guess my best answer is the frequency of that would be dependent on your comfortability comfortability on what their likelihood is that they're carrying that bacteria. If you feel pretty certain they're clean and you, you know, you've inspected the flock that you say purchased animals from and, you know, you know the person and blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, I'd still treat them like they got foot rot, but uh, probably wouldn't be quite as aggressive. Uh, if you're really kind of wondering and maybe they came from an unknown source, then I'd be more aggressive in terms of foot pairing as well as the number of soaks. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and, and leave it at that. We did have a bunch of questions come in on, on drugs and uh, we we could spend hours, I think, sorting through them, <laughs> but we've got yeah. to a lot of a majority of them. I really appreciate the great talk you gave, Mike, and then all, okay, all, all of your fantastic answers to these questions. Um, and I thank everybody for joining us this evening. And I would like to once again uh, thank ASI and the Let's Grow Committee for providing funding for these webinars. Uh, everybody that signed up for it will get a link to the recording. Um, you also have a link um, to the um, slides that are uh, Mike presented here tonight so you can uh, review some of those pictures that he had in there that I'm sure that'll be helpful for everybody so so everybody thank you for joining us uh, and uh, we'll speak to you in a couple of months with another another webinar so uh, thanks again Mike and, th and thank oh, you all welcome thank you very much yeah wish everybody a good evening